very much. Uh, I apologize for being a little frazzled. I did just get off the airplane <laughs> a few hours ago, um, but it was a lovely flight. And I, I want to thank all my, my friends here, up, up the slam especially, and all the people who, from Azamor who have made this happen. And I want to apologize that I speak neither Arabic nor French. Um, so you'll have to bear with my, my English. <laughs> and I'm just going to try to be brief because I, I have heard many things already said and I know I missed some of the earlier ones which I was fortunate to hear in New York when we had the conference and I don't want to be repeating what others have said. I, as a journalist and a book writer, was drawn to this story not so much for theoretical reasons, <laughs> but just because I couldn't get it out of my head that here, and it was really Esteban more than the others, I stumbled across a reference to, it was like the book by Terrell, yeah. you know, from the 60s, and it was about the old trails going west, and it said, you, you know, and it was in inappropriate language, but it said, you know, no white man had gone here before, except 300 years before, and they came with a Moroccan. And I was like, what? So I became pretty obsessed with Esteban in particular, but as we've all said, there's so little about him that's in the historical record that it's a great triangulation to figure out, and everybody can lay on what they hope to find out of him, which is appropriate. That's how history works. I think we, we fool ourselves when we think that there's one right history. So you always have to look at who wrote the book and what were they writing it for. For me, I was just thought the story was so great and I tried to find out everything I could about it. And I traveled almost everywhere that people think they went. But to not be redundant, I'm gonna just stray a bit and talk about what really I think I was able to add to the popular historical accounts, which was I really dove into what do we know about the Native American groups that they lived with, and I won't really talk so much about the Zunis because you, you know them even better and that's the end of the story, but I'll just will say a few quick words about Native America, uh, the Native Amer one of the greatest gifts also of Esteban and his three um, compatriots, uh, well, the three fellow survivors in the accounts that they left is, as was referred to, most accounts of traveling through Native North America are 150 years later or 200 years later after these diseases that, this, that the Europeans and Africans had brought to the America. So this is really the other thing that I loved about this story, because I was a travel writer before I became a history book writer, was these guys were like tour guides to traveling through North America in the 1520s, very, very early on to have or any kind of written account. Um, granted, they were not written by by Esteban himself, but there's just a few kind of myths that I think we all easily fall into when thinking about Native America. And I'm sure that you spoke about the Portuguese and the Spanish and the long 500, 600 year, 700 year history, the whole discovery of the Americas and the roots around Africa are largely because of the rise of Islam and the closing of the spice trade, I'm sure we all talked about that. But we often, when we think about North American Indians, we think it was just a solid thing that was the same for thousands of years and it never changed. There were, we don't think of North American Indians, native indigenous people, um, as also being in the midst of thousand year, 800 year rises and falls of cultures. And in fact, one of the things I discovered in that book and in another book even more that I wrote about the Mississippi River is, of course, <laughs> indigenous Native Americans are human beings with, who have been there for 20,000 years and there are massive cultures that have come and gone 
risen and fallen. And so the expeditions of the Spaniards come into situations that are deeply complex. And Cortez's success in Mexico is precisely because the Aztecs and their neighbors were not happy with each other. Um, Cortez himself, you never hear this when you read the sort of 1950s versions, it's all, oh, he had horses and 400 brave men and he toppled you know, the greatest civilization in North America. But if you read his own account, he says we had 10,000 allies from, the coast, from down on the coast. I mean, they, they knew what they were, how it worked. And so that's, that's one myth that I think we need to quickly just remember. And the, the, in, in, in the case of Cabeza de Vaca and Estebanico and the other two, or the other 500, um, they did come into, the, when they get to the north of Florida, they encounter this group called the Mississippians. It's a cultural group. It's not a single form of, you know, they're not all allies but it is a culture that grew to be the biggest culture in Native American history before, Native North America, before all the diseases. And they had cities up in St. Louis that were larger than Paris at the time, these mound cities that they built, the most famous of which is Cahokia. And these Native Americans of North America, this gets to a sort of second myth that's more about the conquistadors who came to North America, because Cortez was so successful and Pizarro was so successful in South America, usually the stories that are told by Europeans and, and, and anglo and North, whatever, by most historians until relatively recently, is that well, these guys who went to North America, just they weren't as good at being conquistadors. They were bumbling idiots. They were, you know, it was De Soto and Coronado was lovesick and blah, blah, blah. And what's missing in that version of the story is these guys were actually very seasoned. Narvaez was the conqueror of Cuba. He was the conqueror of Jamaica. Well, not, uh, not as much Jamaica. But, you know, he was in line, whatever. He was no bumbling idiot, and he knew he had a string of bad luck. Ditto with DeSoto. But the point is... These Mississippian Indians of North America made short work of three, really four, if you throw in Allion, who, who came to the, the uh, North Carolina coast, made short work of these, of these vaunted conquistadors. Um, and so it's, it's interesting, too, to think of Esteban, and we're now describing him almost exclusively as an explorer, and he was, of course, enslaved, so he's not necessarily at fault here. But these were not like National Geographic expeditions <laughs> going to look for species to save. We need to bear in mind that these were armies that were intending to conquer. And then I would just say the last thing that I, I, I would like to say. Um, well, I would also, I think it, it's important to say that Esteban is at best the second greatest Moroccan explorer. We cannot forget even Batuta or however yeah, we say, yeah, <laughs> you know, but if you put the two of them together, because he was about a hundred years before, you have Moroccans getting all the way from China sure. to Mexico to, to, you know, all the way around the major continents within a hundred and hundred or so years of, of each other. He's amazing. I know he's not from this beautiful town, but and lastly, because I just want to um, be brief and, and then I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. Uh, the, the two, lastly, this is a kind of a joke, the last two things <laughs> I want to say, and they really will be, are two more sort of myths about, um, about I don't want to say myths, but just assumptions that we often start with when we think about Native America at the, time of, at the time of the arrival of Africans and Europeans. And I mentioned one, that they're in their own thousand year processes of rising and falling cultures coming and going. The second, I would say, especially in, in North America, is we have this idea that they didn't really know what was going on and they were surprised that horses and, and black people on horses or with other people on horses, you know, 
By the time those guys arrived in Florida, the Floridians knew darn well what was going on in Cuba and everywhere else. In fact, Ponce de Leon, who was even before them, he arrives in Florida and meets a Spanish-speaking Native American. So it, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, like the pilgrims arrived and found English-speaking Indians. The Native Americans knew what was going on pretty quickly because it was pretty brutal and they were refugee zones. Um, and similarly, even I would say, the question of what happens to Esteban at the end, the whole end of, the whole end of Cabeza de Vaca's description is clearly of this refugee war zone. Everything's disrupted, the people are hiding in the mountains, the, you know, everybody knows that the, if you get close to the Spanish project in Mexico, it's dangerous. So I think they knew full well that Estebanico was traveling with Spanish behind him, or, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to say why I think they killed him, but I think, I, I, I think there's time and again, the Native Americans pretty rapidly know what's going on to the south of them, and, they, and they're def defensive about that. And then the last one, if I can read it, oh, well, just that they're not gone. I mean, you know this, because yes. you go to, you know, this is also a 500, 600 year old project that's unfortunately still going on. Going on in the Brazilian rainforest, is going on in North Dakota, it's going on on Cape Cod even. So it's important to also remember that in this creation of, of this new Atlantic mix, uh, the, 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 the Native American indigenous piece of it is often, in my mind, the one that gets even less shrift than, than the African one. And it's not, it, they both are underserved by generations of white historians such as me. <laughs> but anyway, thank you, and I, I'm, I'm happy to come converse with anybody.